Um, today I'm going to talk about our latest work, Parallel Algorithms for De Novo Long Read Genome Assembly via Sparse Linear Algebra. It's a long title, so I will try to, you know, break it down in the three main components. So I will start talking about the uh, biological problem, the genome assembly, and then um, I will focus on the parallel algorithm where we use Sparse Linear Algebra. So in terms of the problem, the novel assembly is important because we do want to know the complete DNA makeup of an organism in order to study the genetic variations and epigenetic variations. But the problem that we have is that current sequencing technology like have some um, limitation in terms of like, you know, chemistry and physics. So if we have a genome sample, uh, for example, the wheat genome in this case, the sequencing machine cannot read the whole genome in a single run. So we need to run like this sequencing machine multiple times. And what we get is a lot of like short DNA sequences that we call reads. And these are between like 100 nucleotides best pairs longs to 10, like beyond 10,000 best pairs. And the things is that when we sequence, this machine could introduce some errors. So we do want to sequence each location of the genome multiple times so that we can make sure that we have enough, enough data to reconstruct uh, each location. And so for this reason, we sequence the genome depth times. And the thing is that once we have this risk, the de novo assembly problem is to reconstruct the unknown genome starting from this set of short sequences. And this is a challenging task because we do not have the reference. So it's like, you can imagine someone enters in the room, drop a puzzle on the floor and then leaves with the box. So you have no idea if you're gonna, you know, build a puzzle with a cat image, a dog image or a landscape. And then these puzzles are very small and they contain errors as I mentioned. So sometimes two pieces could look similar by chance um, or look different. By, by chance. And the other things to keep in mind in, is that genomes have repetitive regions. And this, the amount of repetitive regions can vary between different genomes, but this in general increase the complexity because you can imagine that, for example, half of your puzzle is gonna be a blue sky. So if you have blue pieces, it's very hard for you to figure out where these pieces come from, like top left, bottom right, um, part of the puzzle. So, but besides you know, the definition, why is this an important project uh, problem, sorry. Um, there are many people that believe that the human reference has been completed in 2003, but this is actually not true. Uh, we just completed a chromosome last year, chromosome X. And I think that another one was completed like a couple of weeks ago. And even if we are able to get the full genome reference, like in a couple of years, maybe, it's still important to be able to de novo assemble genomes because it's been demonstrated that we can find many more variations and important aspects if we de novo assemble genomes. For example, if we sequence my genome and we align into um, like your genome, you know, we might miss some important variations because something that is important in my genome might be uh, classified as an error uh, if we align into uh, someone else's genome. But this is not only important because of the humans, but you know, we can assemble plants and metagenomic and metagenomes that are basically like a, a mix of different organisms. And this has important implication for like bioenergy production, climate change, and human health, like for example, sequencing um, the human gut. And the thing is that why we need parallel algorithms, like in the state of the heart, we have a lot of shared memory software that uh, assemble the novel genomes human genomes and microbial genomes with different like, you know, performance in terms of runtime and quality. But the thing is that having a distributed memory de novo assembler can allow us to characterize big and complex genomes that current shared memory software cannot. And we can also reduce the runtime on human size uh, genomes. So we can have uh, like improve the productivity here. So we have said that there are many, you know, shared memory software. So why cannot we just pick one of those and try to parallelize it? Well, we know that parallel programming is hard. And this shared memory software usually uses many like different data structures within the same software. So, and those are usually irregular data structures and irregular shared memory parallelism that is very hard to map to distributed memory. And in our previous attempt, 
uh, we implemented that is called Dibella 1D. We implemented um, the, the, the alignment part of the novel assembly as a graph algorithm using a distributed trust table. And the question that we answer in this work is like, can we do better? And the answer is yes, using linear algebra. So in Dibella 2D, that is the uh, work I'm presenting today, basically sees uh, the assembly problem through the lens of linear algebra. And what we do is that we move the core data structure from a distributed hash table to a sparse matrix. And we can see in this example where we have a person and the states where that person lived can be mapped from, you know, from a distributed hash table to a sparse matrix. And doing this, we can then represent each step of the computation of the assembly pipeline as a computation between sparse matrices. And this has two main advantages. First, we can have a better organization of the computation and generality. So it's fairly easy for us to change the data structure, like the, you know, the kind of the data structure of the non zero we are working on and the kind of operation we apply between matrices. And also it's a better choice for parallelism because the HPC community has been studying matrix multiplication for, for many years. So in terms of assembly paradigm, we have three main steps. And the first is the overlap detection. So in this case, what we wanna do is to identify pairs of sequences that have some substring, substring that is called Kamer in common. And this is because we want to avoid to have um, a quadratic cost of aligning each pair of sequences. And so we use this Kamer data structure. And once we have identified this pair, what we wanna do is to kind of put them together in a sort of layout in order to extract the main structure of the graph and clean the graph. And once we have cleaned this graph, we want to merge this information to find the consensus region that in an ideal world, it will be a whole genome if it's a single chromosome genome or a chromosome. In practice, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So in terms of um, uh, outline of, of this talk, uh, there are a few different parts, the camera counting, overlap detection, pairwise alignment, and transitive reduction, but I will mostly focus on overlap detection and transitive reduction. So the outcome of the camera counting is basically a distributed histogram, distributed hash table, where we have each instance of the cameras, um, like each instance of the camera in the data set and the number of times that this, this camera appears in the data set and in which sequences or read it appears. Like in this case, the camera ATCG appears three times in the data set in read two, three, and four. And what we do from here is that we map this to a distributed um, sparse matrix. So in this case, we move from a 1D distribution to a 2D distribution. And once we have created our sparse matrix, camers by reads, um, well, we will have also the transpose. So we will have our sequence by Kamer's matrix where each non zero is the position of the Kamer in the reads, and then it's transpose. And once we have these two matrices that are um, like distributed 2D, like a, across a 2D processor grid, we multiply them using a semi ring abstraction. So we know that, like in a standard multiplication, a classical multiplication, matrix multiplication, we have an addition operation and a multiply operation. Using the semi ring abstraction, we can overload this function and use custom operations. So, if we focus on read two and uh, read three in a transpose, what's going to happen is that in the multiply operation, we actually have an assignment. So, if in this case C23 represent the uh, corresponding non zero in the output matrix that identifies the relationship between the read two and the read three. And these non zeros has two fields, position two and position three in this case, that are where we wanna accumulate the position of the cameras that these two reads have in common. So in this case, we simply assign the position of camera one um, to the um, field of the output matrix here and the same position of the camera one on read three here. And what we happen if we keep going and we arrive at the add operation, in this case, it's an add and concatenate. So the add operation basically keep track of how many camers a pair of reads has in common. And the concatenate operation just 
add the position of, you know, if you have multiple cameras, add the position of the second, third, uh, et cetera, camera to that position vector or position data structure. So doing this operation, what we obtain is a candidate matrix C, where we have the number of common cameras as non-zero alongside the position of this camera in the corresponding sequences. And in practice, in the matrix multiplication, we compute the whole matrix. But in the uh, pairwise alignment step, that is the next step, uh, what's going to happen is that we just perform it on the lower triangular because it's, it's symmetric. Before moving to the pairwise alignment and transitive reduction, we can look briefly at the communication costs, comparing like the 1D version to the 2D version. So the 1D version can be seen as like the distributed hash table can be seen as a 1D sparse matrix multiplication using outer product. So what we have is that A and A transpose are distributed uh, block column and block rows. While in the 2D version, we have a square root of P times square root of P processor grid. And we use this in this case, the sparse sum algorithm in complex. And each block, you know, both in the 1D and 2D has on average, a times M over P non zeros, where A is the density of the matrix that we can compute based on the characteristic of the data set. And M is the number of cameras and P the number of processes that we have. What happened in the 1D case is that we multiply each, um, like locally each block row and block column that generates A square, um, A square times M over P non zeros on each processor. And in the 2D case, in this case, for to obtain the A, A transpose, we do not need any communication because the, this processor already has what we need. But what happens is that to compute the rest, we need to communicate the uh, the um, the block of the of the matrix A and A transpose um, to block to the processor uh, rows and processor columns in order to compute the rest of the output matrix. While what happens in the 1D case is that we need an all-to-all -all exchange in order to avoid computing a read, read pair alignment more than one or two times. So we need to broadcast globally the information. And this results in a bandwidth uh, in terms of work count and, uh, num and latency in terms of number of messages as shown here. Another uh, difference in the communication cost between the 1D and 2D version is the way we communicate the sequences because in the step I just explained is the communication that we need to compute the non-zeros in the uh, candidate matrix, so they overlap. But then to perform the pairwise alignment, we do need to also um, distribute the sequences, the actual like DNA strings that we're gonna align and develop 1D and 2D do it in two different ways. So 1D basically ways to compute the candidate overlap matrix and then communicates only the sequences that are needed. While the 2D version, what we do is that we communicate the full range of sequences that a processor might need at the very beginning, as soon as we finish reading the file, the sequences from the file. And this allows us to overlap the communication with the uh, sparse matrix computation. And, you know, one could see that 1D would scale better, technically increasing the concurrency because of the sparser communication. But in practice, the 1D algorithm is tied to this C constant, that is the density of the overlap matrix, so the candidate matrix, that in practice is, is a pretty large value. So the 2D version uh, still communicate less than the 1D version in practice. Okay. The next step, as I mentioned, is the pairwise alignment, and I'm not going to spend uh, much time on this. You can just see the pairwise alignment as an element-wise operation on the um, on the matrix, on the candidate matrix C. And the idea is that you align the, the two sequences, and if the alignment score is smaller than the uh, value you expect based on the overlap that you can estimate from the camera position, then you remove that entry and we obtain the result in matrix error. The idea is that try to prune everything that is like a spurious match or a low quality match. And once we have this result matrix, we are ready to look at the overall graph structure and clean the graph. So this is uh, where we enter in the layout step of the Genova um, assembly process. And we can define the transitive reduction as 
an operation that started from a directed graph D, we can obtain another directed graph with the same number of vertices, but as few edges as possible. So the idea is that we want to remove redundant edges from the graph. And in our case, what we do is that we move from an overlap graph representation to a string graph representation, where an overlap graph could have not only redundant edges, but also redundant vertices. And I will uh, define a redundant vertice in a while, in a little bit. So the idea is that we want to move from this representation to a cleaner one. And we do this into the removing the redundant vertices before the actual transitive reduction, applying an element-wise um, operation, and the redundant edges are, edges are removed during the performing the transitive reduction. So um, before moving to the actual algorithm, there is like um, clarification to do that is, we apply a transformation. So, so far we have been, like we have seen that the non-zero in the matrix is the number of common k-mers and position of the k-mers in the reads, plus a few metadata that we have accumulated performing the pairwise alignment, like the alignment score and the overlap length. And now we move to a slightly different representation where an edge is no more the overlap between two reads, like in this case, it's not C, A, A, T, et cetera but the edge is only the suffix overlap, the hovering of the overlap. So the idea is that when traversing the graph, I do not want to traverse the overlap twice. Like I don't want to read R1 and then read the overlap again. I just want to read R1 and then jump to AT. So moving from this, where we have common camera and camera position to this, where we have the hovering and the directionality of the edge. Since in our, the DNA has two strands, so we want to be able to traverse the graph on both direction. In practice, for, for this example, I'm just gonna assume we have a single direction that is the forward direction, so we can assume it's a directed graph. So um, as I mentioned, we want to remove redundant vertices and what is a redundant vertex is basically a read, a sequence that is fully contained within another read, like in this case, R2 is a redundant vertex because its connection does not add any useful information to the graph. Everything that R2 tells us is actually already said by R1 and R3. So we are gonna remove this kind of uh, vertices and all their connections, of course. And now we are ready to dive into the transitive reduction part. So the first thing is that we want to define the transitivity rule. So like how we define a transitive edge. And the idea is that since we want to retain as much useful information as possible, we want to remove edges that have longer hoverings because a longer hoverings means a shortest overlap, a shorter overlaps. So we want to move in this case from this to this. And the way we do this is of course using matrices and the first operation is the squaring of the matrix R. So this is the post alignment matrix in order to obtain the neighbor matrix N. And basically what we want to obtain in the neighbor matrix is if we have two parallel paths to go from like a read R I to a read J, we want to keep the shortest path, like the shortest of rank. And we do this using a mean plus simmering. So in looking at the graph, what we have is that the multiply becomes an add. So in this case, we, uh, we add with some this edge from R1 to R2 to this edge from R2 to R4, and we obtain like a 19 length edge. Then we have a parallel path that in this case is, is the same length of 90. And then the add becomes a mean operation. So in this case, we are gonna keep the mean. This is the same though. So in this case, we will just keep one of them. Then once we have to do this, we want to apply an element-wise operation between the result matrix N and our neighbor matrix. Uh, the idea here is that the neighbor matrix has the shortest path. So if we have a value in the neighbor matrix that is smaller than the corresponding you know, element-wise element in R, it means that there is a shortest way to get from that tree to read I to read tree. And if they have the same value, we still want to retain the value in the end matrix because it means that we have more vertices and more like higher depth. So we want to keep that. So in this case, we can see that uh, if you look at the graph equivalent that 
in the neighbor matrix, we have like R1 to R2 and R2 to R3 that is compared to this R1 to R3. And in this case, they have the same values, but here we have more edges. So we have a higher depth. So this is what we want to obtain, we want to retain. And this will be the same results is, for example, this would be 70 instead of 60. So we mark R1 to R3 and similarly R2 to R4 as redundant edges, as transitive edges. And in the next step, what we do is that we want to remove these redundant edges from the original matrix. So we uh, element-wise multiply S and the logical negation of I. So in this case, uh, we are gonna remove these two edges from the matrix R, obtaining the matrix S. In practice, these uh, operations that I just described are repeated multiple times in order to identify three, four, five, et cetera, ops neighbor. Uh, but the square of the matrix, the squaring of the matrix is the most compute intensive operation in the transitive reduction since the rest of the operation are mostly element wise. There are actually a few more operations that we do in the middle to make the algorithm robust to, to the errors that we have in the sequences data, but I believe this is good enough to understand uh, how our algorithm works. And then, so the result is that we move from the result matrix R to the string matrix S that looks like this. And now I'm gonna show some results. So this is like a comparison of our 2D version with the 1D version on two different data set. And we can see that um, they both scales pretty well and like very similarly, but the 2D version is between 1.5 to two times uh, faster than 1D constantly, like, you know, at, at different scales. This is our strong scaling of the 2D version on two different machines, so Corey Haswell and Summit CPU. And we can see that the scaling is, is, is pretty good, is around 80% parallel efficiency. And if we look a little bit more closely at the runtime breakdown, this is the same data set, same run. The plot on the right does not have the pairwise alignment runtime just to show the bottlenecks. So we can see that the alignment clearly takes most of the time. And that's why you know, we are working on GPU accelerating this part. And once we uh, remove the alignment part, the sparse matrix multiplication during overlap detection so the first part that I explained is the most compute intensive one alongside the camera counting that I, I just touched briefly today. And we can see that the transitive reduction is this pink layer on the top, and that doesn't scale particularly well, but it's, but it's pretty fast, so that's, that's expected. So today I presented uh, Dibella 2D, that is a distributed memory pipeline to build and transitively reduce a string graph for the novel genome assembly using sparse matrix computation. And among our future works, we have the completion, of course, of the de novo genome assembly pipeline. So the steps I'm currently working on are content generation, and then we would have haplotype resolution and scaffolding to actually obtain a chromosome scale um, assembler. Plus we have uh, ongoing work to optimize the performance that includes mostly GPU integration of uh, pairwise alignment, camera counting, and sparse matrix multiplication. And this is being contributed by uh, amazing colleagues, Israel, Richard, Vivek, Brandon, and Eric. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I hope to see you at the IPDPS live session.